Good morning, everyone, to week six, day two. Uh, we're going to do a few more reviews of the midterm, which starts at 11. Um, again, it opens at 11, closes hard close, Monday, 10 a.m. Uh, I put up a couple of practice midterms. Um, every semester, I get people asking, do I have to take the practice midterm? And the answer is no, it's a practice midterm. You don't, you don't have to. It doesn't count for anything. But uh, it'll, it'll give you an idea of the kinds of questions that I ask. Um, the midterm is very dry, straightforward, like um, nothing, no surprises on it, I don't think. Uh, so let's go through some of the old, other ones. And some, sometimes the topics are, are different from semester to semester. So if it's something that we haven't um, talked about, you know, don't, don't panic over it. All right, so here we got um, a truth table question. And... Uh, for this one, I have you write in ones and zeros. I, I think on the current one, I have you do T, T and F, T for true, F for false. So <clears throat> the way, a, how many times can you take the practice midterm? As many times as you want, and it tells you the answers too. So there's two practice midterms. You can, so that's 60 questions, something like that. You can do the, the questions I put up <clears throat> on the current midterm are along the same lines. Like I said, there's uh, like we haven't really gotten into fallacies yet. We've we've done a couple fallacies, but we haven't done a lot of fallacies. So if you see uh, some things on there that we haven't covered, don't don't panic. It's just uh, something we're going to be getting to soon in this class. Um, okay. So when you do truth table, basically you start by going through uh, the the truth table begins with like kind of every combination of true and false for the inputs. In this case, the inputs are x and y. And we're trying to compute the truth of x ord with not y. So you kind of go one. It says the practice midterms are worth points. They're not. They're they're in a category that is worth zero points. So if you get a hundred percent or zero, it doesn't factor into your final grade at all. It's in it's in a grade category worth zero percent. So um, so we you, you go kind of like one column at a time as you do a truth table. You kind of fill out one column at a time. Uh, the first one here is not y, so you do not y by nodding, not ing, the truth value of y. So true becomes false, false becomes true, true becomes false, false becomes true. Cool. It's done for you. Now for this one, um, x ord with not y. So we're going to or together two different columns. The first column is the x column here, true, true, false, false. And we're going to or that with the not y column, the third column here. So we're going to say what is true ord with false? True or false is true. And then we got a true and a true. That's true. We have a false or with false. That is false. And we have a false or with true, which is true. So there's the answer there. And we use truth tables in programming all the time to figure out if our programs are working correctly in every possible combination of input. You know, sometimes programs can get quite complicated and you want to just kind of run through all the different possibilities. Okay, you know, only give a jackpot if, you know, this and this and this are true. So, um, a very common programmer uh, trick. Also, just useful in life in general. Uh, there's no truth table this complicated on the current midterm. Uh, the, the one on the current midterm is about this complicated. It's four, four rows. And worth four points, by the way. So make sure you, you understand this. If not, post on the Help Center. It'll help. Okay. Uh, for this one, yeah, I guess I'll run through it just so you can see how it works. X, Y, and Z. And we're trying to compute the truth of X and Y ord with not Z. Okay. So X ended with Y. So we're going to look at the X column and the Y column. And we're going to end the, true tooth, the, the two truth values together. So true ended with true is true. True ended with true is true. True ended with false is false. True ended with false is false. False ended with true is false. False ended with true is false. False, false, false. Okay. And then, uh, so we have the X and Y column filled out. And the not Z column is done for you. So now we are going to or together the results here from the X and Y column. Or with the not Z column. And this is kind of how you do a truth table. You just kind of, uh, every column you fill out uses a column to the left or two columns to the left. Not like, not the immediate two always, you know. Like for this one, for X and Y, it's using two of the columns to the left that are these two. 
No, it ignores the Z one because it's using X and Y. Now for this one, uh, it's going to be using the X and Y column, this one, and it's going to OR it with this one. So true ORed with false is true. True to ORed with true is true. False ORed with false is false. False ORed with true is true. False ORed with false is false. False ORed with true is true. False ORed with false is false. False ORed with true is true. Okay. So there's the answer. Uh, we haven't gone over these fallacies yet, so ignore those, ignore those, ignore those, ignore those, ignore those. I love fallacies, we haven't gone to them yet. Okay, here we go. Um, is this argument invalid, valid, or sound? Rotten meat smells bad. Premise two, I do not have rotten meat in my hand. Conclusion. Therefore, I do not have something that smells bad in my hand. What do you think? Valid, invalid, or sound? Put your votes in now. Put on the Jeopardy theme music. Rotten meat smells bad, I think is true. I think that's a true premise. I do not have rotten meat in my hand. Also true. Show both my hands. No. Nothing there. <clears throat> now, first question. Does the logic hold? Does the logic hold? Is it, can I conclude that I have nothing that smells bad in my hand just because I don't have rotten meat in my hand? Is that logically valid? Can I, can, can you deduce logically that just because I don't have rotten meat in my hand, that I don't have anything that smells bad in my hand. Is that is that valid? No, it's not. I could have um, a, a durian or something in my hand, right? I don't know if you guys have ever smelled durian before. It is uh, a fantastic odor. Um, they look like danger pineapples and. They actually don't taste horrible, but their smell, oh lord, their smell, Whew, right? So, um, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Yeah, some people do like the smell, but durian, durian kills me. Yeah. So, uh, do you understand why this is invalid? Like, a lot of people get sort of caught up in like, okay, is the premise true? It, you know, is the conclusion true? But that's that's wrong. That's that's the wrong way of approaching these sorts of problems. And there's going to be like four or five of these on, on, mid, on the midterm. Okay. Um, you have to, you have to say like, all right, raw meat smells bad. I don't have raw meat in my hand. Therefore, I don't have something that smells bad in my hand. You can't conclude that. You don't know. You don't know from, from the premises that I have something that smells bad in my hand or not. All you know is that I don't have raw meat in my hand. Right there, there's other things that smell bad, and and this is something that I kind of tried driving home over and over again. Let's let's see how y'all did on the quiz. Let's let's take a look at that one because that'll that'll kind of guide me on how I lecture right now. So this is the quiz from from Wednesday quiz statistics. Ooh, okay, average sixty five percent. All right. So let's, let's go through the quiz. <laughs> if I read a book, I will become educated. I'm educated. Therefore, I read a book. Nope. I could have become educated through other means. Right? To the 32% of you that got that wrong, think about it. Like, not everybody who became educated um, read books. Right? It's, it's possible you just, like, watch YouTube videos or something like that. For the quiz, you thought he wouldn't put the same answers for all of them, right? <laughs> there's there's four possibilities. There's four questions. Certainly, there must be one for each one, right? Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I know the student mind. I know how the student mind works, and uh, and I, I will troll it. Okay. So, uh, if I apply sunblock, I will not become sunburned. Premise two, I'm not sunburned. I'm not, I'm a little pink, but I'm not sunburned. Conclusion, I applied sunblock. 
No, I actually just didn't go out in the sun very much. It's winter time, right? Probably have a vitamin D deficiency from that, you know? So, um, right, X implies Y, uh, not Y, therefore, uh, oh, actually, this is from the consequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So, X implies Y, you state Y is true, then um, you conclude from that erroneously, fallaciously, that X is true. So, just think about it. Just think about it. Is there another way that I could become sunburned? Right? Or not become sunburned? Just like by staying indoors. The not here probably uh, made things a little bit more confusing to people. Uh, if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, you will get sick. You are sick. You were bitten by a rattlesnake. You could have gotten COVID, right? Are there other ways of getting sick? Yes. <laughs> right? So you could have gotten COVID. You could have gotten the flu. You could get cancer like my friend. So that would be affirming the consequent. Also, all four of these were affirming the consequent fallacies. And it's interesting to me, you know, the difference in uh, responses on them. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, you'll get sick. X implies Y. Y. X. This is the invalid form. You have to learn how to recognize these, these different forms of argumentation. And not just guess and not just be like, well, there's four questions and there's four possibilities. So there's one of each. Like, you have to... It's a critical thinking class. I will mess with you sometimes. So, identify the form of the argument. If you lift weights, you will get strong. Premise two, you are strong. If X, then Y. Y, therefore X. Again, affirming the consequent fallacy. All four of these are affirming the consequent fallacy. And uh, uh, it's possible to get strong by other means, right? You get strong by, like, plowing the field or, you know, you know, like, there's lots of ways of getting strong, not just lifting weights. So, um... Any questions about this? All right. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Raw meat smells bad. I do not have raw meat in my hand. Therefore, I do not have something that smells bad in my hand. This is invalid. All right. Is this argument invalid, valid, or sound? Community pharmacies such as Walgreens or CVS dispense medication. Pablo works in a place that does not dispense medication. I'm telling you this one's true. He doesn't. Therefore, Pablo does not work in a community pharmacy. What do you think? Community pharmacies dispense medication. I think that's true. Yeah. Pablo works in a place that does not dispense medication. No, oh, I'm telling you this is true. Therefore, Pablo does not work in a community pharmacy. So first thing is the logic. Is it Does it necessarily follow that if uh, community pharmacies dispense medication, which is true, if Pablo works in a place that does not dispense medication, there is no possibility that he's working for Walgreens or CVS. You know, he cannot be working for a community pharmacy. If he was, he'd be working in a place that dispenses medicine. But he's not, so it is impossible for him to be working in a community pharmacy. So this is at least valid. It's at least valid. Pablo Escobar, no, Pablo Rosales. He's a friend of mine. Um, so we know it's at least valid. Now, is it true? Is it true that community pharmacies dispense med medication? Yeah. Again, this is not something that I'm, I'm really like interested in splitting hairs on, you know, like, well, you know, the Walgreens by my house, their pharmacies closed down due to short staff. Like, no, like, just, yeah. Community pharmacies do dispense medication, and I'm telling you this one's true, so this is a sound argument. Okay. Is this argument invalid, valid, or sound? Italy is a country in Asia. Aaron, a friend of mine, is not from Asia, and I'm telling you that's true. She's actually Therefore, I can conclude Aaron is not from Italy. Hmm. Italy's a country in Asia. All right, so X is Y. Okay. Aaron is not... X is in Y. Aaron is not from Y. Therefore, Aaron is not from X. 
Yeah, I think I think the logic's correct. The logic is correct. Now, a lot of a lot of people will just look at this and be like, wrong. Italy is in Europe, it's not in Asia. Invalid. Mm -mm. Can't you can't do that. Can't do that. Mm -mm. Can't do that. Uh, that's the second question you have to ask. The first question you have to ask is, is the logic correct? And and a lot of times it just helps to just replace words with like X and Y. Like, like X is a country and Y. Okay? Aaron is not from Y. So is it possible that Aaron is from X? No, because if Aaron was from X, then it, it would be in Y, and we know Aaron's on Y. This is a valid argument. This is a valid argument, but it's not sound because Italy is not, in fact, in Asia, right? So uh, this is actually a valid argument. And, and a lot of students, their their first reaction is like, wrong, wrong, invalid. That's not what invalid means. This is not what invalid means. Invalid does not mean the premises are false. That's what soundness is about. Soundness is about if the premises are true or false. Validity is if the form of the argument, if the logic of the argument is correct. And if you were to just replace this with uh, X is a country and Y, Aaron is not from Y, therefore Aaron is not from X, you can see that, yeah, that's actually correct. That's a correct thing. Like, uh, um, California is a state in America, Aaron is not from America, there, therefore Aaron cannot be from California. Because if Aaron was from California, she would be from America. Right? So... A lot of times it helps if you just swap out those words, you know, and, and that because 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 it'll get you like your brain's like, no, that's wrong. And wrong is invalid. Yeah. Okay. You guys understand that? This is a valid argument. It's valid, but not sound. The premises are not true. Question one, does the logic work? Question two, are the premises correct or not? For this one, yes, the logic is correct. No, the premises are not true. It is valid, but not sound. Okay. Next one. Ireland is a country in Europe. Aaron is from Ireland. Let's say it's true. I'm just giving you that one's true. Ireland is a country in Europe. Aaron is from Ireland. Therefore, Aaron is from Europe. What do you think? Valid, huh? So if you're saying it's valid but not sound, that means that you are, if you're saying that this is valid but not sound, what you are arguing is that the logic is correct. And I, I do think the logic is correct here. X is a country and Y, Aaron is from X, therefore Aaron is from Y. I think I think the logic is, is valid, yes. But if you're saying it's valid but not sound, you are disagreeing with this statement here, that Ireland is a country in Europe. And uh, I think it's a country in Europe. So, um, I mean, it's an island, but technically it's part of the European continent, I guess, even though it's not, I don't know. But yeah, you know, it's considered a European country, right? So, uh, this is in fact a sound argument, right? Ireland's part of the European Union and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, if, if you say it's valid, that means you're saying Ireland's not a European country. Uh, is this argument invalid, valid, or sound? All mammals have hair. It's true. It's the definition of mammal. Even dolphins have hair. The coffee I am drinking is not a mammal. Therefore, the coffee I am drinking does not have hair. Hmm, this is tricky. All right, let's break this down. So, all X have Y. My coffee is not X. Is it possible for my coffee to have hair by other means? Uh, it is, in fact, true that the coffee I'm drinking is not a, a mammal, right? This is actually just coffee. Uh, is it possible, though, for my coffee to have hair via other means, such as, um, you know, somebody's hair falling into it or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Right? It's in invalid. Uh... Because I, I can't conclude whether or not my coffee actually has hair from it just from the fact that it's not a mammal. Sure, it's not a mammal, but, like, you know, 
should have an eyelash or something fall into it, you know? So that's invalid. Okay, match this statement to the theory of truth that we're using here. Well, what you're saying is factually true, but it would hurt my political beliefs. So it's false. What do you think? Which theory of truth is that? Remember, there are five uh, commonly accepted theories of truth. I list six because uh, the, the, the one listed here is uh, disturbingly common in our society, especially when it comes to politics. And uh, do you remember the theory of truth that says that which is true is that which benefits my political party or that which benefits the revolution you know, as the original formation of it. But I think a more modern way of putting it would be, you know, that which is true is that which benefits my political party. Anyone remember that? Which theory of truth that was? You see this a lot in politics. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Obama nominated Merrick Garland uh, for the Supreme Court. Uh, Mitch McConnell said, uh, no, you can't do a Supreme Court nominee in the last year of your presidency. That's not allowed. And then Trump, you know, uh, nominated somebody in the last year of his presidency and Mitch is like, yeah, it's all out, you know, just because it, you know, what, what's true depends on what was politically expedient for him, it looks like. You know, remember? There's dead silence on the uh, chat channel. And if you think Democrats don't do the same thing, you'd be, you'd be wrong, right? Like the, um, you know, uh, the opposition to uh, the Supreme Court justice, like I said, like was driven by the fact like, he was politically opposed to people, right? And uh, and if you look at how people viewed the testimony of Christine Blasey Forrest versus Kavanaugh, like it fell just right along party lines, right? Like Democrats believe Christine Blasey Ford, Republicans believe Kavanaugh, and independents were split 50-50 down the middle. And so, you know, if, if people determine truth just based on what's politically, you know, expedient, yeah, it's, uh, it's a problem in my opinion. And this would be Marxist theory of truth, since nobody's saying anything on, on uh, Discord about it. Okay. Uh, it is true that electricity exists, because if you stick your finger in an outlet, it will hurt you. <laughs> it doesn't matter if electrons or negative charges or positive charges and which way the electricity actually flows in the circuit. All that really matters is that if you stick your finger in a hole, it'll shock you. And remember what theory of truth this is. I'll put the list up here. It seems like uh, that might help. Yeah, pragmatic theory of truth. Like, who cares? It just works. <laughs> you know, it's uh, oftentimes called like the American, you know, pragmatism is oftentimes called like the American philosophy system. Developed by... Uh, William James and Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, James was a famous Harvard psychologist and things like that. So um, it's like, look, who actually cares, <laughs> you know, how radiation works? All we know is that it does, you know, and it's true. Okay, it is true that snow is white because if you go outside and look at it, well, it's white. Which theory of truth is that? You go out there, you look at it, oh, yeah, it's white. It's true. Snow is white. Assuming it's not yellow snow. That which is true is that which you can be like, oh, there it is. Yeah. Washington, D.C. is the capital of America because it is. <laughs> you know? Like, um, it is true that my guitar has six strings because it's got six strings. Like, look, there it is. This is the most common uh, truth theory used in science, and it's called the correspondence theory of truth. So look, my statement, my guitar has six strings, is true because it corresponds to reality. That's how reality is. So, uh, it is true that Leonard Skinner is the greatest rock and roll band of all time because it was voted on by a large online poll. So... It's clearly not correspondence theory because you, there's no sort of like way of making an observation being like, all right, this music's 
better than another. Like there's very subjective, you know, kind of thing. But what are the, what are they arguing for here? It is true that Leonard Skinner is the greatest rock band of all time because uh, some Rolling Stone magazine or something did a um, did an online study, uh, online survey, and it was voted number one. That would be consensus, absolutely. Okay, so we know that two plus two equals four because we have rules of mathematics that, that govern how math works. And uh, if we follow those starting axioms, the starting things we know to be true that are self-evidently true, we can prove all sorts of interesting true things from those starting points. And so we know that two plus two is true because it matches what we know to be true already. Which one is this? We know something to be true because it matches other things that we know to be true. It coheres with what other things we know to be true. Yeah, it's coherence theory. So coherence theory, like, is actually kind of how the human brain works. It, we use it a lot in math, but it's also just kind of how the human brain works. Like, if you hear, like, a story, like, this just, like, way out of character for, like, one of your friends, like, um... Like, if you heard that, like, you know, your professor, Kearney, like, just pulled out a gun in Sierra Vista Mall and started shooting the ceiling, like, you'd be like, I don't know. Like, that doesn't seem, like, in character for him. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. And so, when we oftentimes just use coherence theory just in daily life like that, like, where it's just like, eh, that doesn't really match uh, what, you know... Mm, I know, right? So, um, um, it's one of the reasons why people like doubt like um, aliens and things like that because just your your daily life doesn't involve aliens, and so you know it's like eh, doesn't seem doesn't seem likely to me. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when we say something is true, uh, it's it's basically meaningless. It means you're just agreeing with somebody. So under, that's uh, the last one, deflationary theory of truth. Under deflationary theory of truth, uh, basically there's no such thing really as truth, this grand idea of like something is true. It's just like agreement. Like it's just a emotional kind of like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, so that's deflationary theory. Okay, any questions about the theories of truth? There are, I think, six questions on the midterm on this. This one had one worth six points. But um, on the midterm that is going live in half an hour, there are six different questions on theories of truth. So if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. There's silence on Discord, so. All right, last question. Uh, Different philosophers are giving ideas on how to help the homeless. Try to figure out what moral system these philosophers are using. We must give food to the homeless since our holy books spoke about this at length. Which moral system is this person using? Right. Our religion says we should feed the homeless, therefore we should feed the homeless. Which moral system is this? Divine command theory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter if you enjoy helping the homeless or not. You have a moral obligation to do it, since helping others should be a universal rule. Hmm. Who's the guy that was all about, like, think about, you know, if your actions could be universals. You know, act in such a way that if everybody did it, the world would be, like, kind of cool. And if nobody did it, you know, the world would be horrible. Yeah. So you basically just kind of imagine, like, what if everybody, you know, kind of helped the homeless? Would that make the world a better place? Or, you know, and uh, so that would be that would be Kant, right? Immanuel Kant. And uh, yeah, so that would be a Kantian way. And Kant's all about duty, but you know, the categorical imperative is the notion that you just kind of think about your actions and think about what if everybody did it, what if nobody did it, and that kind of is your sort of objective guide to whether or not something is moral or not. If everybody could do it, yeah, cool. Yeah. Do it. Right. Helping the homeless would help us cultivate character traits of generosity. So we should do it. 
things. It will help us grow as individuals. Or another way we could do it is that, you know, generous individuals who have this virtue uh, would help the homeless as part of their um, excellence as a human being. Or something like that. So this one is, in fact, virtue ethics. Virtue ethics is all about cultivating the character, trying to become an excellent human, trying to maximize your virtues and minimize your vices and find the golden mean between extremes of character and things like that. Uh, it's okay to cut up homeless people for spare parts, since killing one person could save six. This is unfair <laughs> to to most utilitarians, I think. Um, but um, uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, it is uh, um, uh, consequentialism is the big school of thought. Sub school of thought of the is utilitarianism. Sub school of utilitarianism is ethical hedonism. So, uh, on this question, I put down consequentialism. On your midterm, it'll say uh, ethical hedonism, which is uh, the subschool of utilitarianism, which is a subschool of consequentialism. But basically, what the consequentialists look at is um, the outcomes, right? Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to spoil Star Trek Two for you, but. Um, Do you guys know The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II? It's, it's an old movie. It's before my time, even. Actually, maybe it came out like when I was a kid or something like that. But. So basically, um, at the end of uh, at the end of Star Trek II, um, Spock sacrifices his life to um, save the lives of uh, everybody on the Enterprise. And he says, uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right? It's a utilitarian perspective, right? So he gladly sacrificed his life in order to um, save the lives of everybody on the Enterprise. So, uh, good movie, and they remade it. Yeah, with a Benedict Cumberpatch or whatever his name is. Yeah. Um, the original, the original, I think, is, is much better. Yeah. Um, fantastic movie, if you've never seen it. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so that, that's a utilitarian way. Spock was a utilitarian. He said the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So, um, yeah, and that's also one of the common criticisms of utilitarianism is like, well, okay, so you can kill one person to save the lives of six. That seems wrong to me. I don't know. You know, and that's because a lot of people kind of buy into utilitarianism, at least to a certain degree. But at the same time still feel that there's like inherent value in human life and things like that and so Kantian ethics um, believes that humans should be ends not means to an end and this here would be using a person as means to an end like we're going to chop one person up to save the lives of six people we're using him as a means to an end and so Kantians would be very opposed to that obviously divine command theory looks very poorly in most religions that I'm aware of would look very poorly on you know chopping up the poor um, most religions have quite a lot to say about helping the poor, all right? And uh, the last one here, which is natural rights theory, uh, believes in the inherent uh, right to life to a person. You know, the only way you can lose that right to life is if you, like, commit murder or something like that. Like, if you deprive somebody else of their right to life, you've forfeited your own or something like that. So natural rights theorists would be like, no, you can't, you can't do this, utilitarians. And so the... Um, you know, that's why my friend, he said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a utilitarian to a certain extent. I'm like a moderate utilitarian, right? Because there's some things like this where it's like, nah, you know, there's still there's still other concerns, like the inherent value of a human and, you know, these other things. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest criticism of utilitarianism. Yeah. It is very popular, though, and especially in the more moderate regions. You know, just try to maximize happiness for the most number of people. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward thing for most people. Let's see how I did. 17 unanswered questions, oh dear. Yeah, let's not worry about it. So, cool. Um, there's another practice midterm again. Oh yeah, I didn't do all the fallacy stuff. So, um, so that is that. Is that. Um, maybe I'll do a couple more of the valid and valid sound ones. Let's see if I can find some more examples of that. Because it feels, it feels to me like that's the, that's the, um, 
topic that kind of causes the most problems, I think. Um, let's see if I have any on here. Um, yeah, let's just go over this one more time. So, uh, premise one, Socrates is a man. Premise two, all men are mortal. Conclusion, Socrates is mortal. What do you think? Uh, X is Y, all Y are Z, therefore X is Z. What do you think? Is it valid, invalid, sound? What do you think? X is Y, all Y are Z, therefore X is Z. I think the form is valid. Is it true that Socrates is a man, and is it true that all men are mortal? Yeah, I'd say so. Again, I'm not really interested in like hair splitting, like, well, I haven't died yet, so who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's, this is a sound argument. Yep. All birds can fly. Bats are birds, therefore bats can fly. So, uh, all X are Y is actually kind of the same argument that we just had before, right? You know, Socrates is a bird, all birds can fly, therefore Socrates can fly. It's the same form. Do you see that? Like, like think about it. Socrates is a bird, all birds can fly, therefore Socrates can fly. It's the same form. It's valid. It's valid. It's not true though. <laughs> like the premises are not true. Step one, is it valid? Yes. Step two, is it sound? Are the premises true? No. Bats are not birds. Okay. So it is valid but not sound. All cats are mammals. All dogs are mammals. Therefore, all cats are dogs. Hmm. All cats are mammals. All humans are animals. Therefore, all humans are cats. Hmm. Seems to be something off there. All cats or mammals is true. All dogs or mammals is true. But can you conclude that just because two things share the same attributes, like, um, you know, um, I can swim, pirates can swim, therefore I'm a pirate. No, you can't. You can't conclude that, right? Do you understand? Like, just because I, you know, all X have an attribute Y and all Z have an attribute Y, it doesn't mean they're the same thing. Like, um, you know, elephants are big, dinosaurs are big, that doesn't make elephants dinosaurs. You know what I mean? It's not a valid... It, it, and that's kind of... That's kind of the mental process that I'm trying to ingrain in you by going over this for, like, a whole nother lecture because you need to just, like, think about it. Like, all right... Um, you know, just because two things share an attribute, like being mammals, doesn't make them the same. They have to share all attributes for them to be the same. Okay, if Socrates was a philosopher, then he wasn't a historian. Socrates wasn't a historian, affirming the consequent fallacy. <laughs> right? So, this is, you should, you just saw four of these on your quiz that was due today. X implies Y, Y is true, therefore X, mm-mm. Affirming the consequent. No, sir, that's invalid. Okay, all engineers enjoy ballet. Uh, probably false. <laughs> probably a false premise. But we can't just stop there, right? We can't just stop there. We can't say it's invalid because validity has nothing to do with the truth of the premises. That's soundness. Okay? So some males are engineers. That's true. Okay? Some males are engineers. Therefore, some males enjoy ballet. What do you think? Some males are engineers, and all engineers enjoy ballet. Therefore, some males enjoy ballet. It's valid. It's valid. If the premise was true, if it is true that all engineers enjoy ballet, and it's true that some males are engineers, then it's certainly the case that some males enjoy ballet. Absolutely. Follows necessarily from the premises. Trouble is, the premises are wrong. So it's, a, it's not sound. It's valid, but not sound. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, it's pretty good for today, I think. Um, any any further questions? Anything? We got like ten minutes left. Anything you wanna you wanna see? Um, 
I, I've I've been teaching this class for a while now, for years now, and and usually it's the validity, the valid, invalid, and sound that usually causes the biggest problem on these midterms. Usually students are pretty good at recognizing the ethical theories. Just kind of review them, just go over them, have a study guide, go over the theories of truth. That usually doesn't give people much trouble. Um, truth tables sometimes do if you just didn't pay attention during the Zybooks or something. Uh, but it's it's usually the valid, invalid, and sound. <coughs> <coughs> that causes the most problems. Thank you. Thank you. Right, just maybe get together with your friends, um, put together some arguments yourselves, you know. Um, all squares have four sides, premise one. Um, premise two, all rectangles have four sides. Conclusion, all squares are rectangles. Invalid. Just because two things share an attribute doesn't mean they're the same. Okay, I guess we'll just call it class early because it's, yeah, I don't want to start a new, a new topic with eight minutes left and a midterm to go. So we'll just call it there. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this extra time spent looking at um, these topics will help you on the midterm. It's, I, I really want to see you all do well on this. And uh, um, just because there's four questions for modus tollens, modus, tollens, modus ponens, affirming the consequent, dying the antecedent, doesn't mean each one of them get one question. Okay, I hope you learned that from the quiz on Wednesday. Is it just because there's six, you know, options and there's six questions doesn't mean there's one of each. Maybe there will be. But maybe not. So, all right, that's the last hint I'll give. <laughs> okay, cool. I will see you all on Monday. Peace out.